nothing like that. It says, you know, long before you get there, you know, because it says in one verse, at the judgment day, each man's record will be put in his hand. You look at it and say, yeah, it's obvious. Yeah, see? <laughs> no surprise. I hope the judge is in a good mood or something like that. If your record is in your hand, you can figure it out. Now, if that's true, that means at any given moment, if somebody said to you, you ready to die? You should be able to think about that for a minute. The Muslim could say, well, no, as a matter of fact, I'm not. Or he might say, yes, all right, I'm ready to die. That doesn't mean he believes, oh, I'm guaranteed some kind of a place in paradise right away like that. But he knows when he's ready. He's got things in place. He may even think, now, I haven't made up for this, and I haven't looked after that, and this piece of business is unfinished, and that can't be helped, maybe. But he knows when he's ready. The difference between that attitude and the attitude of some other people is that if you ask the Muslim, are you ready to die today, he may be able to tell you yes. But if you ask him, will you be ready to die a week from tomorrow, he'll tell you, I don't know, till a week from tomorrow. He will not tell you, but some people say, any time, I, I have a contract with God, says I'm saved, that's already been taken care of. The Quran talks about that in the second surah, twice mentions this. Speaking of some people, says, do they say they have a contract with Allah? I want to point out that uh, that's a thing to say, but can you prove it? Show me the agreement he made that says, don't worry about it, you can die any time, everything has been looked after. Nobody has that. But at the same time, nobody's in doubt. They know what to expect. In fact, they tell it, there's a well-known story of one uh, the Muslims 14 centuries ago, and there were still just a handful of them in the world, in uh, Mecca, is it the uh, Kubaib? And the Meccans had told him they were going to crucify him. Said, you won't leave this religion, then we are going to kill you. But we will give you some time to make some prayers before we execute you. So Hubaib went over and he prayed just two rakat, two quick prayers. And he came back and he said, I would like to pray longer, but you would think I'm afraid. So I cut my prayer short. Let's get on with it. That's, that can be the position of the Muslim. Okay, uh, sorry, that takes a long one. <laughs> well, this is another, this is interesting. Remember I mentioned before, I said there's one church that insists that uh, the Christian should not eat pork, and they prove it from Bible verses. Uh, there are other churches who will insist on just what the subject this question is. Is there any mention in the Bible that Christians must not touch liquor? There's some churches will tell you, yes, they'll prove it to you from the Bible. Because they look very, very carefully at the words. In some churches, it's forbidden. They base it on this consideration. They read where it says, Jesus drank wine. And they say, but wait a minute. Wine is our translation of a word. What, what was it he was drinking? So they look back through the whole book to see what does this book say about wine and you come to a passage, you can find it if you have a, a um, concordance of the Bible, look up wine, you find in the Old Testament a place where in a sentence it talks about wine and strong drink. So based on that they say, well whatever this word wine is, it's not strong drink because in this sentence it says wine and strong drink when discussing beverages. So based on that, they will say the Christian shouldn't drink wine. As I said, I, I wish that uh, maybe someday somebody will come up and sponsor some energetic person to do their research for several years, but I'm convinced that if somebody looked at all the reasons why one church splits from another church, in most cases, they are Islamic reasons. What I'm saying is you could take the whole content of Islam and base it on the arguments of this church and that one and that one and that one. They've all done at least one of the arguments based on their sources for what is part of Islam, whether it is pork or blood or alcohol or on up to doctrines and so on. <laughs> Does the Bible say that a Christian man cannot have more than one wife? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, it doesn't. It does say um, there is a recommendation given. Uh, Paul is writing about 
bishops or whoever looks after a, a congregation of people, however you want to translate it, they used to translate it bishop. He said, uh, let a bishop be a husband of one wife. Uh, it's not the same thing as saying one man, one woman, and so on. It, it has never been part of Christianity. As recently as 300 years ago, the Lutheran Church in Germany recommended that men take more than one wife because there had been this long war that had uh, wiped out so many men and they recommended to build up a population. This is what we should do. It's frowned on and it's very much a part of culture today to say one man, one wife, but technically you don't find it anywhere in scripture that it's one man, one wife. You find Jesus talking about the importance of this bonding, how sacred it is, the two shall be as one, and so on, but nowhere do you find him saying it can't be so. The Jews, for that matter, I don't, any, no Jew today that I can imagine would have more than one wife. It doesn't change the fact they always used to used to be part of Jewish law, it was five, except for the king could have 18. That's just the way the, the law was put together. But time and culture creep in, and then people tend to think that the culture must be based on something back in the scripture. But no, just times have changed. It never did change the rule there. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, yes, I see how it looks. Christianity has many things in common uh, with Islam. Since Christianity was born before Islam, do you think that Christianity was an innovation, I guess, um, which has been misunderstood and interpreted incorrectly? Uh, yeah, okay, introduction, yeah, okay. Well, in the first place, I have to dispute that since Christianity was born before Islam, there are Christians who will tell you that isn't true. Uh, uh, I guess most people, they look and they see, well, uh, Jesus lived in these years, and 600 years later, uh, we have this other man, so this religion came after that one. But other people have studied it more carefully than that, and I'm not talking about Muslims, I'm talking about people within the churches who will tell you, well, it didn't work like that. The religion that the Arabs had dates from 18 centuries at least before Jesus, and when this man Muhammad came, he merely reminded people of what they had overlooked or still had in their possession but had corrupted. He really didn't tell them anything new. They were already practicing. They knew who, who was Abraham and his sons, and uh, they knew a lot of the stories of the prophets. They still, uh, today, uh, stood there where uh, Hajar and her son Ismail are buried. Uh, it's always been part of their tradition. We had a a man came one time to a, a meeting we gave and he came up with a question at the time and he says, I have a book here that's uh, be too much for Muslim ears. He says, you dare not let me read it. So the chairman said, oh, go ahead, read. You have two minutes. What do you want to tell us? So he proved this, proved it. It was from a Christian book. It was all the archaeological proof that Islam was not a new thing. It had been around for centuries, since the time of Abraham. The Muslims had all of the, or the, the Arabs had all of these beliefs, all the details from Islam. And he sat down and he was very happy. I said, thank you, that's what I believe to start with, and you proved it to me. He was under the impression Islam started 14 centuries ago, and if he could prove to me it was just an old thing, that somehow it was a fake thing. Matter of fact, the Muslim believes it goes back, as far as men go back, it's always been around. Maybe not by that name, but it's always been around. Okay, just make another. Uh, Jesus can't be the Son of God because if so, um, the Son and Father must be the same. That is, Father equals God, the Son equals God. Uh, the Father hasn't the Father, so that's not true. Uh, that was my argument, I guess. I think that's what you said. What about Cain? He was Adam's son. Uh, Adam is a man. Uh, Cain is a man, but Adam had no father and uh, was a man. Well, to start with, it was not Adam's, I'll get into trouble here, but I'll point out to you, the Quran does not specifically say Adam didn't have a father. It doesn't specifically say that. It seems to indicate that. It's perfectly compatible with everything that's in there, but specifically it doesn't say that. But for the sake of argument, suppose he had no father. The point is, by nature, what is he? What is he made to be? He is a reproductive item. His life came from somewhere else. He doesn't contain it in himself. 
he was whatever a lump of clay or something and someone else